Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm instructor Jim Bytel, and today we're going to use a virtual reality system called ZSpace to take a quick look at some hydraulic components, both inside and out. ZSpace is a proponent of bringing learning to life through immersive and interactive experiences. This lecture operates under the presumption the viewers watch the hydraulic directional control valves and hydraulic schematic lectures, both available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't watched these lectures yet or only didn't recall their contents, please take the time to do so now. In the aforementioned lectures, we examine the basic function and schematic symbol of a number of different hydraulic components, but never really examine the inner workings on any level of detail. Such disassembly, reassembly, and visual inspection activities are often best done in a hands-on lab exercise with real equipment. This being said, not everyone has a well-stocked lab environment, nor the financial resources to acquire one. For this reason, virtual reality equipment like ZSpace can fill the need. Users can tear apart and inspect an array of electromechanical and hydraulic devices without the associated expense, banging their knuckles on a wrench, or spilling oil all over their white cable knit sweater. True story, a former student showed up to a hydraulics lab one day wearing a white cable knit sweater. As poor of an idea as this was, it was way better than the guy that showed up to a hydraulics lab wearing shorts and Crocs. But I digress. In addition to the 2D visualizations featured in this lecture, ZSpace offers a circuit simulation environment and immersive 3D visualizations that really bring a component to life. Additionally, if you are lucky enough to have a well-stocked lab, ZSpace makes a great pre-lab exercise to preview those subcomponents and parts that make up a larger component under inspection. Let's take a look at a representative example of some hydraulic components using ZSpace. Let's start by tearing apart a couple hydraulic pumps. The three main styles of positive displacement pumps commonly encountered in hydraulic systems, gear pumps, vein pumps, and piston pumps. We'll examine the internal workings of these devices in greater detail in later lectures, but here's a quick preview. First, Let's check out a fixed displacement gear pump. The external view isn't so impressive. However, with ZSpace, a click of the mouse takes us to an exploded view where we're going to identify the pump body, the drive or master gear, and the driven, slave, or idler gear. Another click on the mouse and ZSpace shows us the operational principle view of the gear pump. Gear pumps use a pair of meshing gears to provide pressurized flow to a hydraulic system. As the drive gear is rotated by a motor or internal combustion engine prime mover, Liquid is trapped in the spaces between the teeth and transported around the gears from inlet to outlet. Next, let's check out a variable displacement unbalanced vein pump. A click of the mouse takes us to the exploded view where we're going to identify the cam ring, veins, and rotor. Another click of the mouse in ZSpace shows us the operational principle view of the vein pump. As the rotor rotates, note the inlet sees a region of increasing volume. This portion of the unbalanced main pump would therefore be performing the suction phase of a positive displacement pump. As the veins extend out of the rotor, they serve to provide a clear and definite separation between the inlet and outlet, characteristic of a positive displacement pump. Oil trapped between the veins and cam rings brought around the outlet port and deposited in a region of decreasing volume. This portion of the unbalanced vein pump would therefore be performing the compression and exhaust phase of a positive displacement pump. A piston working opposite the spring can vary the eccentricity of the rotor with respect to the cam ring and vary displacement per revolution, thus stepping up or down flow rate to meet the needs of the system. Lastly, let's check out a variable displacement axial piston pump. A click of the mouse takes us to the exploded view where we can identify the piston block, the pistons, and swash plate. Another click on the mouse in ZSpace shows us the operational principle of the axial piston pump. With the swash plate held at an angle, the pistons inside the piston block create a region of expanding space such that the inlet sees a region of increasing volume and the pump performs a suction phase. As the pistons continue to rotate along the angled swash plate and slide inside the piston block, the entrapped oil experiences a region of decreasing volume and the pump performs a compression and exhaust phase. By varying the angle of the swash plate, one changes the displacement per revolution, thus stepping up or down flow rate to meet the needs of the system. Let's take a look at a couple hydraulic actuators. Actuators convert hydraulic power input to mechanical power output. Hydraulic cylinders produce linear mechanical power, whereas hydraulic motors produce rotational mechanical power output. First up is a hydraulically extended, spring retracted, single acting cylinder. A click of the mouse takes us to the exploded view, where we can identify the cap end plate, the cap end port, the barrel, the piston, rod, the rod end plate, and the wiper or gland. Note a hydraulically extended, spring retracted, single acting cylinder only has an active cap end port. Any opening on the rod end is just there to keep the spring space empty. Speaking of which, 
central to a hydraulically extended, spring-retracted single-acting cylinder's operation is a spring in the rod end. Another click on the mouse, and Z-Space shows the operational principle view of the hydraulically extended, spring-retracted single-acting cylinder. When pressurized oil enters the cap end, the spring on the rod end is compressed and the rod extends. When oil in the cap end is dumped to tank, the spring in the rod end expands and the rod retracts. Hydraulic actuators aren't limited to linearly actuating cylinders. Consider this gear-style hydraulic motor. The exploded view shows a gear-style hydraulic motor is similar in construction to a gear-style pump. We can see the drive gear and driven gear and the pump body. The operational principle view shows that oil enters the pump body, it pushes the teeth of the drive gear and rotates the shaft while the idler gear spins idly, hence the name. Let's now take a look at some hydraulic directional control valves. First up is a manually actuated four port, two position directional control valve, the cross connect position and a straight through position. The transverse view shows how the position of the sliding spool selectively connects and disconnects various passages inside the valve body. The exploded view shows an offset spring, spool, valve body, and manual lever. The operational principle view shows that in the deactivated state, the offset spring positions the spool to a cross-connect position, such that pressure port P is routed to actuator port B, and actuator port A is dumped to tank T. When the operator moves the lever, the spool shifts into the straight-through position, such that pressure port P is routed to actuator port A, and actuator port B is dumped to tank T. When operator lets go of the lever, the spring offset returns the spool to the cross-connect position. Such a valve might be used to control a double-acting hydraulic cylinder that fully extends in one valve position and fully retracts in another. Next up is a double solenoid actuated, four-port, three-position hydraulic directional control valve with a closed center. The exploded view shows the spool, valve body, and solenoids and centering springs on both sides. The operational principle view shows that in the deactivated state, the opposing center springs center the spool in the closed center position, such that pressure port P, actuator ports A and B, and tank T are all blocked. When one solenoid is energized, the spool shifts to the cross connects position, such that pressure port P is routed to actuator port B, and actuator port A is dumped to tank T. When the other solenoid is energized, the spool shifts to the straight through position, such that pressure P is routed to actuator port A, and actuator port B is dumped to tank T. Such a valve might be used to control a double-acting hydraulic cylinder that extends in one valve position, retracts in another, and the center position can be used to lock it in place. You note this type of closed center valve isn't necessarily the most efficient, since the closed center position blocks the pressure port and will cause the pressure relief valve to open and dump excess pressure to tank. For this reason, not all directional control valves are closed center. Consider this manually actuated, four-port, three-position hydraulic directional control valve with a tandem center and instead of blocking P and T, passes P to T such that pressure relief valve isn't actuated. The operational principle view shows that in the deactivated state, the opposing springs center the spool in the tandem position such that actuator port A and B are blocked, however pressure port P is routed to tank T at low pressure, contributing to the greater efficiency of the larger system. As with the previously discussed three-position valve, when our operator moves the lever one way, the spool shifts into the straight-through position, such that pressure port P is routed to actuator port A, and actuator port B is dumped to tank T. When we move the other direction, the spool shifts to the cross-connect position, such that pressure port P is routed to actuator port B, and actuator port A is dumped to tank T. All right, let's end this virtual tour with a quick look at a pilot-operated pressure relief valve, an essential safety component for any hydraulic system. The exploded view clearly shows two sections, the primary and the pilot. The primary section consists of the primary valve body, the primary spool, and a light biasing spring. The pilot section consists of a manually adjustable pilot spring and a small pilot dart or cone. At input pressures less than the set pressure, the pilot dart remains seated so pressure on both sides of the primary spool is equalized and the light bias spring forces the primary spool closed such that it blocks the primary passage input to output. If, however, input pressure exceeds the set pressure, the pilot dart or cone is forced off its seat, upsetting the balance of the primary spool such that it opens the primary passage input to output. In this fashion, the pressure relief valve limits maximum pressure and contributes to the safe operation and longevity of a larger system. All right, that is that. In conclusion, this lecture examined the internal construction and operational principle of a handful of hydraulic pumps, 
actuators, directional control valves, and accessory components using a virtual reality system called Z-Space. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell you Lazy Lab Partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank <laughs> you.